Welcome to Melt, I'm Suresh Venkat. Last month, research firm Kantar unveiled the 10th edition of its Brand Z Top 75 Most Valuable Indian Brands report. The big headline, while Indian brands have remained resilient during the global slowdown, tech brand Tata Consultancy Services retained its spot as India's most valuable brand. And HDFC Bank, Infosys, Etel and State Bank of India round up the top five. To know more, we are in conversation today with Dipinder Rana, Executive Managing Director, South Asia Insights Division at Kantar, Soumya Mohanty, Managing Director and Chief Client Officer, South Asia Insights Division at Kantar, and Madhusudan Rao, the Executive Director of Beauty and Personal Care for HUL. What are the trends that have defined the growth of homegrown brands over the last decade? And what do marketers need to keep in mind for the years to come? Let's find out as we get ready to melt with Dipinder, Soumya and Madhusudan. Madhusudan, Soumya, Dipinder, welcome to Melt. Dipinder, first question for you is the 10th year of the Kantar Brand Z survey and TCS, which is a B2B software services company with hardly any Indian consumer interface, ranks as number one in your brand list. What explains this? I mean, it was the number one last year as well. And even if you look at the global top 10, you know, there are many, many brands which are B2B because B2B brands are strong brands in their own right. I mean, they're just meant for customers rather than consumers. Uh, one mm -hmm. of the reasons is, I mean, if you look at the methodology, there are two parts to that. There's financial value and then there's brand value, right? The brand component of that value. Obviously, these are hugely valuable companies in their own right, you know, TCS, Infosys, and they're a big part of our economy, right? At least the overseas export economy. So that is why they are one of the reasons they are on the top is because of the sheer size of the financial mm -hmm. value. But they're also strong B2B brands, you know, in their peer context, in their category context. And that's why they're on top. As a follow-up, I have to ask you that three of the top 10 brands are software services companies. My question is, what are these guys getting so right about brand building that the others right. can learn from? The drivers of uh, what makes a B2B brand great is somewhat different from what makes a consumer brand great. Uh, so if you look at, for example, corporate reputation is a big element of that. Can I trust this service provider and will, be there, will they be there? Do they understand my needs? Another key component is, are you attractive to your workforce? Because for the software companies, attracting the best so workforce and being... And keeping and, attrition low, I imagine, yeah, retaining those yeah. who are already So there. if I look at the data for TCS, for example, it's very high on corporate reputation. Part of that is from the Tata assurance. The brand Tata itself carries a lot of assurance. And then they are very strong employee reputation as well. Right, and that's one of the reasons they make it makes them strong. But the other thing is they're jump they're being innovative in their own right. I mean, they're jumping on to the AI led solutions. You know, many of their solutions now are uh, have an AI component infused into it. And funnily enough, now TCS is also beginning to give a message to Indian consumers. So their latest uh, campaign is about storytelling to Indian consumers about why technology matters. How does it make your life easy? So they are beginning to... There is an Indian consu there is consumer a, story. Yeah, well. in that sense. Okay. And they, I think it's called TCS Stories, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. Yeah. So I'm the reverse question of that to you. In the top 10 brands, we don't see any FMCG brands. And that's a bit surprising because you'd imagine FMCG would be in the top 10. Yeah. And in fact, there are like two parts uh, to why that is so. One part has to do with how FMCG companies build their brands. Uh, because they are mostly portfolio companies, right? So Unilever has multiple brands in our top 75. So if you add all of them up, uh, the value would be very high. So you, unlike a TCS or unlike ICICI, or unlike HDFC, these are portfolio companies. And therefore, individually, those brands do tend to lose out a bit when you sort of look at their financial value. So I think that's one part, which is very specific to the way the valuation the process is, the methodology of the study is. I think the second part is uh, FMCG co companies face very low entry barriers, right? It's very easy for smaller challenger players to just enter in and then sort of start biting away uh, into the value. So it's, it's, it's very hard to keep the value going, to sustain it. And a lot of the brands in the top 75 had done a very good job of it. I mean, Surf is one of the brands that has done a very good job of it. Many of the Unilever brands have done a good job. You have Maggie, which has done a great job. So there are brands that have done a great job uh, and they probably need to do a lot more and a lot harder. 
because it is much more difficult in that sense to sort of you know maintain yourself in such a fragmented category. Having said that, I'll say Coca-Cola this year has made a re-entry into our top 10 global ranking. Okay. So to that extent, it is possible. It's just not as easy probably. Okay, let me get a counterpoint from Madhu. Somebody just said the entry barriers in the FMCG segment or some segments are low. HUL's distribution network and brand building efforts should pose a pretty high entry barrier, no? Yeah, so that's always been the advantage for HUL for a number of years. It is not just about the physical entry barriers that one should talk about. It's also the barriers in which uh, the brand can manifest itself in the minds of the consumers. That's true. Yeah. And a lot of our brands have been built over decades, which stand for not just functional values, but also very strong emotional. And that's a high connection. entry barrier. Decadal reputation is Decadal a... reputation and how the brand continues to connect and stays relevant. I would imagine is the biggest entry barrier and that's why in the list continuously you see a Surf XL or a Vim or a Red Label or a Lifebuoy uh, continuing to show up for all the things that Soumya mentioned. So I would say that while it may be easy for new brands to come in to sustain brand building successfully over a long period of time in India is still very very difficult and I think Unilever has demonstrated that for you to have a successful bouquet of brands over many decades, there are a lot of principles and barriers that you need to get right and do it relentlessly through generations of marketing. And how important is building the portfolio brands vis-a-vis -vis building the HUL brand in itself? Dipinder just spoke about how TCS builds a brand to attract employees, for instance. Right? People don't work for a surf or one of your portfolio companies, they work for HUL itself. How important is that? To you? So we do both, uh, Suresh. The first one is a lot of our consumer facing activities are led by the brand. Yeah? So the brands have to live in their own space and they have to create value with the consumers and therefore high intensity of our investment is brand facing. At the same time, the actual mother brand is equally important for corporate reputation. A lot of our society building activities, Correct, whether it is have. water conservation, for example, I'm just taking some of the many things that we do, are all led by brand HUL. Employer brand for attracting the best talent has got to be HUL. So, therefore, it happens at both levels, which is the HUL brand as well as what we do with our consumers. When we talk about expanding our distribution network and attract the best of the talent on distribution, our stock is are attracted more by the HUL brand HUL and the principle brand. that HUL represents, Understood. which is about doing business the right way, standing for certain principles and doing things right. So it is equally important for us to drive the value of the HUL mother brand for a number of other reasons. But our main business is, is building is the brands portfolio brands and right. a portfolio of brands. Dipinder, there are four banks among the top 10 in the Brand Z survey. What does this say about the current state of the Indian economy? I mean, one is we are beginning to not even call it the banking category. Now we call the financial services category. So the definition has changed. In a way, not only do you see the banks, you of course have insurance companies, but this year phone pay mm -hmm. has made it. Okay. Fintech and phone pay, which is a part of the same category, financial services, has made an entry at number 21. Right. Similarly, cred has made an entry. Mm -hmm. So I think what it tells you, coming back to your question about the state is, A, India is maturing as an economy where the needs are growing at the basic end of the segment. So you see a lot more rural people getting banked. You see a lot more women getting banked, which wasn't the case earlier. right? And then the banks are really benefiting from A, what the government has done with the, you know, the payment infrastructure and, and India, stack. Uh, India stack, right? But then on the other hand, uh, just the consumers adopting digital technology is really helping them. Right? And is this a phenomenon that's echoed in other countries as well, that banks are in the top 10? Well, yeah, I mean, one of the reasons is that banking tends to be a slightly protected sector. Yeah. You know, it's not as open as packaged goods are across the world. So if you look at the key champions or the major players in each category, I mean, I used to work in China and then, you know, the four big Chinese banks were always a part of the top ones as well. Because, you know, banking is not a category which, so typically these are also national champions. Many of them are state-owned. Now, mind you, India, both state-owned and private-owned banks are both doing, a, or publicly, you know, listed banks, both are doing a very good job in terms of building their brands.
Somya, the Brandsy report says that if you if you created an index fund and that comprised of the top 75 brands in the Brandsy survey, that index fund would have outperformed the Sensex and the Nifty. First of all, what does this say about the mutual fund industry? If Kantar can launch a mutual fund, that's going to well, outperform. I've been thinking about that. I've yeah. been with I Kantar 28 years and it. I'm like, kind of, yeah. Are you going to launch a, get, enter that's, the BFSI category yeah, that's yourself? A, that's a very, by the way, that's, that's a very interesting way <laughs> to summarize what Branzi says. Uh, Branzi says that uh, investing in your brand is like you're banking for future and you are investing for future. And uh, when you are doing that, you are going to outpace and outperform the market. And even in India, if you look at it, actually, post-COVID, the Sensex has also gone up quite a bit. But it's gone up quite a lot. So to that extent, for Brandsy portfolio to outperform Sensex hasn't been as easy. But it, uh, the brands have still done that. So simply put, you keep investing in your brand. I think 30% of the business value we are attributing to pure brand. And when you keep on investing in that 30%, it sort of protects the rest of the 70% from the kind of headwinds uh, that tend to happen. Some CFOs may disagree with you. They see brand spending as a cost center and not necessarily contributing to the bottom line. How do you tackle that equation? With well, the we CFOs? provide the data. We provide the evidence that shows marketers like Madhusudan here that look, there is value in brand building and it's for them then to convince their CFOs that uh, we it's not a cost center yeah i mean if i were to just add to that there are two components to that one is what we call demand power which is all about like how many more consumers can you attract the brand, yeah. but the other one which is a key part of our our uh, calculation and valuation is pricing power which is can you charge a justified premium so if you look at bottom line contribution and hence share price contribution pricing power has actually been proven to be even more powerful. And from the consumer's point of view, there was a flight to quality in the last couple of years. People went to the trusted brands. Yes, that's right. right. Madhu, next question for you. According to the report, the Indian consumers seem extremely optimistic. With over 70% things are going either very well or fairly well in the country. Do you agree with this assessment, 70% of the country? I fully agree with that. And I what explains this optimism? I think there is a sense of optimism, uh, not just now, but it's been there with the Indian consumers for some time. A lot of that has got to do with the uh, demographic profile. We are a very young country. Nearly half of our population is less than 25 years old. The youth are really optimistic and they are achievement driven. And there are a lot of factors that are actually bringing this optimism. So there is something about the mindset. But on ground, there are absolutely rock solid foundations that are driving this optimism. Uh, you take the in investments into infrastructure. Yeah. The job creation, which we see coming through consistently in a big way. Uh, we've been lucky with the monsoons that are coming in successfully consistently. So the rural economy has been really booming. Uh, the monetary policies that we are maintaining and bringing in fiscal discipline and building up our foreign exchange reserves. Uh, the focus on inflation control. So a lot of macroeconomic factors have created an environment where the industry is thriving. You look at some of the consumption data consistently going up, real wages going up, both in urban and rural. So when wages go up in both urban and rural, then you see the upsurge in consumption. So that actually creates the sentiment that things are going up. Again, you see the movement of consumer affluence across the pyramid. Uh, I'm sure you all have the data, but 15% of the households are LSM 7 plus, you know, and if you look at the number of households that constitute this number, it's bigger than Canada or the UK put together. So you can see the positive shifts of standards of living going up, affluence going up, all creating a sense of movement up, a sense of really, you know, achieving in life. That creates the sense of optimism and positivity. So I would actually say in summary, there is a lot of macroeconomic GDP driven focus fueled by consumerism, availability of choice, and consumers really now climbing up the ladder of moving up on the standards of life. Okay, just to strike a contrary note, Dipinder, your report clearly states that the Indian rich are getting richer, and we can see that. We see millionaire lists being yeah. published every day. Does this mean the gap between the rich and poor is getting wider? And if so, why are the poor optimistic up to 70%? I think that what we call K shape, earlier it was called K shape recovery, now we call it K shape consumption, that continues. 
So if you look at, you know, uh, auto sector, it's the SUVs that are doing They can't keep up well, with the demand. There's like a 16 week waiting yeah, period yeah. for any Luxury car. Luxury is doing well. But just to be clear, this is not an Indian phenomena. Even globally, we see this coming. So what is happening is, uh, you know, luxury sector is doing well and then the premium brands generally are doing well. But at the same point of time, the brands that uh, are able to fulfill the needs of the not so well off, right, have also done well. So the brands that are actually getting squeezed out are the ones in the middle, a bit like neither here nor there. So I think that that tells you that you can, you know, with a with a with the right portfolio of brands, you can succeed. Both at the top end. Both at the, the top end and the and the bottom end and the largest marketers, you know, are doing that. So I, I would add to that yeah. to say that while the K-shaped economy franchise is a global phenomenon, uh, we should not conclude that the affluence at the bottom end of the pyramid is going down. It is rising, but there is also a larger differentiation between the rich and the poor that is emerging. Both are true. Both are true. The rich are getting richer and the poor are also getting richer, maybe at different speeds That's perhaps right. is what you're saying. Madhu, I have a question for you. You said rural a little while ago. What exactly does rural mean anymore in India? We have rural pockets in a big city like, like Mumbai and we have rural villages far away from the, from the city of Mumbai. So what does rural mean in marketing, in, in a marketer's language? So in the marketer's language, rural is uh, primarily an economy that is driven by agriculture. Geographies that are heavily dependent on farm labor dri driving the economic value. Uh, so that, that really is the definition of simple rural. Uh, so we can again further classify that into villages that are clustered around agrarian incomes. So when we talk about India, we say 600, 625,000 villages, which would all be classified typically as rural India. Now, more and more, I think we should talk about the trends in urbanization and how there is a huge shift in movement of people into centers of affluence. So apart from the big metro cities, we see tier two, tier three, and down the pop strata, a lot of towns agglomerating into, uh, I would say, mini urban centers. Correct. And that's where there is a migration of the population. So many of these villages, while we don't have the latest census, I'm sure would have actually transcended the definition of a village and grown into towns. Clustered into these small clustered into agglomerations these towns. of a small urbanity. That's right. So I think that trend is more important in terms of where the consumers and the affluence is migrating to. So rural, the way uh, I think many of the government's uh, websites and government studies point out is used more in the traditional sense of definition to make this point clear that there is the urban part and then there is the rural part but absolutely critical in terms of driving the growth because a lot of the growth for FMCG companies and for our country gets turbocharged when there is an uplift in the rural faster than that of urban. Yeah, that we see that when rural grows faster, then the overall impact on growth for the entire brand or for the organization the multiplier effect is more. And if we are going to follow the model of Western countries, the number of people employed in agriculture is going to shrink steadily. They're going to move into other service-oriented industries. Correct. What? How will the definition of rural change, let's say, 25 years from today? So today we know that about 45% of uh, labor is employed in agriculture. Uh, and that part is coming it's going down. To come down. Yeah, it will come down. It will come down. Services will go up. Manufacturing will go up. What will happen is the productivity of agriculture will dramatically increase through better technology, through better farming, uh, you know, techniques available. So that I think is an in inevitable. inevitable and an eventuality. Uh, but given the size of our country and the food needs, I don't think it will shrink to the levels of what we see in the in US. The, in the West. It would still be a very sizable population. So all of you have been listening to what both Dipender and Madhu have been saying. What does this mean for marketers who are specifically targeting the bottom of the pyramid? What does it mean for them? I think I, I also wanted to add a point when both of them were talking about, uh, you know, this K-shaped or urban rural. I think the similarity across India is the similarity of aspiration. Okay. Whether you are in urban or you are in Bharat, whether you are at the top end or you are at the bottom end, everybody is constantly striving to go ahead. Mm -hmm. So in that sense for marketers, it's, it doesn't ex it, there's nothing fundamentally different. Mm -hmm. I have to talk to the aspirational consumer and I have to provide her a ladder to go up. And if I am providing a value ladder, 
to every consumer in that entire pyramid. I mean, I am protected from all sides. And that, and that like to rise up the affluence ladder. Absolutely. Everybody, I need to have a product for every part of that affluence ladder. I need to fulfill the need at every part of the ladder. I think that's pretty much what marketers have to do. Let's talk about one specific part of the ladder. D2C brands are clearly on the rise. Are D2C brands fungible? If I don't get brand A, brand B seems just as good because they all seem to be funded in a similar manner, use celebrities in a similar manner, build their brands in a sort of more or less the same way. So are D2C brands in that sense fungible? I mean, they're fungible or not fungible to the same degree as any brand is. So to that extent, uh, D2C brands pretty much rely on discoverability or serendipity, right? I am online and suddenly I discover a brand. And I sort of pick something up. And then you get hounded with get, ads yeah, for that I brand. Get, yeah, right. and then I sort of get latched onto it. Now, but if the proposition is good, if the offer is good, then it builds stickiness. If the offer is not good, then obviously it gets dropped out. And by the way, startups have lost close to 15% value between last year to this year in, in, in yeah. Ranzi. Yeah. So some of them have got a great proposition and they are keeping their consumers happy. Some of them don't. And that is where I think they need to learn how to build brand value for sustainably the for the long term. Final question in this discussion goes to you, Madhu. The Brandsy report says FMCG growth is happening in terms of value but not volume. What does this mean for players like HUL? So that would have been the case last year when we saw a lot of uh, inflation, Suresh, and you know commodity-inspired inflation yeah. across the globe. Yeah. Uh, but if I reflect on what's happening currently, a lot of the growth is driven primarily by volume. Volume growth, and that is exactly. a good sign for FMCG. You know, you are actually talking about organic growth. When you say volumes, it's more number of units being sold, more number of units reaching households, expansion of categories. Perhaps more consumers buying more goods. Clearly, more consumers, penetration increase. So, any day FMCG would trust a lot more volume growth. Of course, we need to get the balance between price and yeah. volume growth. But if it is totally centered around pricing like last year, then it needs to correct. And what we are seeing today is volume growth. Uh, it is also the sign of a good economy and good consumer sentiment when more number of consumers start coming in and more number of brands and uh, you know categories drop penetration. So market development, if that is what I would imagine a key part of what India will see in the next 10 years, would all be driven by penetration increase and volume growth. And when we are able to drive new category development, consumer education mm -hmm. and see the pickup in penetrations and volumes, I would actually look at it as a good sign. Madhu Sudhan Rao, Samya Mahanti and Dipinder Rana, thank you very much for being part thank of America. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very Suresh. much. And with that, it's a wrap on this episode. You can follow Melt on social media. The handle is ready to melt or simply log on to readytomelt.com. If you'd like to follow me, it's at Suvink on X, formerly known as Twitter. Till next week, goodbye and thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.